Well, welcome to this. I think it's our 74th edition, actually, of Palestine Deep Dive. And I'm delighted today that we're being joined by Amy Shalan and Ben Jamal. Uh, we want to hear from you, of course. Uh, so please do um, send your questions in, send your points in. Uh, we, want to, we want to... Uh, broaden this discussion out. There are lots of important things happening. Uh, my name is Mark Seddon. I, I used to work for the United Nations. I was a speechwriter for the uh, former Secretary General, uh, Ban Ki-moon. Um, and I also was a foreign correspondent for Al Jazeera television. But we are far more interested in our guests. Amy Shalan is co-director of MACAN. She's also a trustee of Friends of the University. Uh, she's a policy member of the Palestinian uh, a, a committee, I beg your pardon, Polis, Palis, the British Palestinian Committee, uh, as she's chair uh, of the of Al Shabaka. Her previous roles have included chief executive of Medical Aid for Palestinians. Uh, she's been director of Friends of Beer Zeit University and uh, co founder and director of Pressure Cooker Arts, which is a not for profit arts and advocacy organization. And Amy has been a regular contributor to The Guardian and many other media outlets, and holds a doctorate in the politics of Palestinian literature. So thank you very much, Amy. Welcome to you. Uh, ben Jamal, um, uh, of course, many will uh, will know Ben, uh, and Ben has been a guest on Palestine Deep Dive before. Ben is the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, which, as we know, is the largest organization in the UK, campaigning for justice, peace, and equality for the Palestinian people. And he's also a member of the British Palestinian Committee. Um, and also, uh, I wanted just to make a little shout out to somebody who is hopefully joining us today from uh, the Midlands, uh, Mike Watts. And I mentioned Mike Watts because Mike, um, back in 1964 or 65, he can't remember quite which year it was, proposed the first uh, motion uh, at Hounslow Labour Party calling for a boycott of apartheid goods from South Africa. Um, Hounslow Council, Hounslow Labour Council, as it was, was the first local authority uh, in Britain to pass that resolution and to support the boycott campaign, which had been launched in 1960. So, Mike, if you can hear us, if you're watching us, welcome. Um, and, and, and thank you for all that you did. Uh, then, because of course, what happened then uh, very much is uh, pertinent to what is happening now. And we are here today, of course, to talk about the defending the right to boycott. That's what you, Mike, were doing back in the day. Uh, and that's what people up and down the country are doing uh, and have been supporting the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign. And of course, we know that there is legislation currently going through the British Parliament, uh, the bill was, uh, uh, was, was introduced to Parliament last Monday uh, and has its second reading on the 3rd of July. And this would prevent local authorities and other public organisations from boycotting uh, Israeli goods or organising campaigns to do so. So we're, we're, we're here to talk about that today, uh, primarily. But I just wanted to begin um, and... Uh, and, and with you, Amy, if it's all right, uh, by asking you, uh, because I know you're, you know, you're a member of the British Palestinian Committee, in the past uh, few weeks, you've published a very powerful policy briefing, and it's aimed specifically at British lawmakers. I mean, the timing of this is, uh, you, you know, you, you, you might have thought there might have been a rather more media interest uh, in, in it because of, of what you have put together the set of suggestions you have made um, at a time when there is this focus on BDS. But I wonder if we could begin with this. Um, and I'm going to come to you as well, Ben, on this, uh, because, of course, you know, you've been involved because you have come up with a, a whole series of quite simple suggestions, really, for British lawmakers to to support. It's uh, it's not a it's not an impossible wish list. It's just, It's the kind of thing that actually... Um, many people would say it's just common sense if you support uh, the self-determination of Palestinians and equality. So I just wonder if you could just, just let us know a little bit more about this report that you've put together and what you are hoping 
uh, to come from it. Um, certainly, and, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, on, on the show today. And um, just to just very quickly give a little correction, though, um, just at the beginning, I'm not chair of um, a Shabaka. I'm chair of the British Palestinian Committee. Um, just wanted to. I'm a member of a Shabaka, but uh, not not chair. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. Um, so yes, essentially, um, this report um, or policy briefing rather was put together. Um, by us, we're a group of um, British Palestinian citizens, We've got a range of different backgrounds, including policy, advocacy, human rights, um, law, academia, journalism, arts and culture. And many of us represent other organisations or constituencies um, that are concerned with the promotion of Palestinian rights. Um, and we felt that it was absolutely essential to have a basic briefing really as a starting point. I mean, essentially, we are now 75 years uh, into an ongoing Nakba. We are witnessing daily killings and injuries, the incarceration of Palestinians, forced expulsions, home demolitions, repeated bombardments of a captive population within Gaza, and severe discrimination against Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, as well as attacks on human rights defenders working to hold Israel to account. And of course, the ongoing denial of return for Palestinian refugees, um, as well as an essential right. So we, we felt it was really beyond time to interrogate the very flawed framing of what essentially is a situation of unequivocal injustice. Um, and this framing that has been used, I think, uh, as by British policymakers over decades now is a framing that really obscures the root causes of the situation. It allows for very partial approaches. It allows for the dehumanization of Palestinians and also the very selective application of international law and the erasure of our collective rights. So we felt that a, a fresh approach was really essential um, and that there were real and concrete and very simple, meaningful actions that policymakers could take in support of freedom, justice, and equality. Um, so we were really starting, I guess, with that as a very basic starting point. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I, Amy, I mean, there's been, I know a lot of people have been talking about the need for a British Palestinian community, an umbrella group for such a long time. It has come about. Can you tell us something about um, the organisation itself? You know, who, who's part of it? You know, I, I know you're talking quite broadly there about, you know, what lawmakers can do and should do, but bring it bring together in this 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 new gathering. To tell tell us something a bit more about it, if you will. Um, certainly. So essentially, we started off as quite an informal network of, uh, as I was saying, sort of policy uh, analysts, advocacy workers, human rights workers, lawyers, uh, academics, journalists, um, and other people working in, in different fields, really sort of leaders of different uh, in different areas. Um, and we came together because we felt really that there wasn't uh, a centering of Palestinian voices within decision making around uh, Palestine um, in Britain. And as British citizens or residents of Britain, um, we really needed to have a, a voice um, and be listened to. So we're, we have now established ourselves as an independent uh, organisation. Um, and uh, it's not affiliated with any particular political party or religion or ideology um, in Palestine or in, in Britain. Um, and although we don't make any claim to represent British Palestinians as a whole, our members essentially represent a very broad, um, diverse range of British Palestinian experiences and perspectives. And Fundamentally, we are committed to the three clear principles around freedom, justice, and equality. Um, and we uphold the core inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, including the right to self-determination and the right of return to our historic homeland, and all associated rights that are enshrined within the various bodies of international law. Um, so that's that's a sort of brief background to the organisation. And what, and what kind of reception are you getting? 
Um, well, I mean, it's always been a struggle to have people listen to Palestinians. There's plenty of people speaking on behalf of Palestinians, but essentially, um, I, I think as, uh, unless you are engaging on other people's terms, um, people don't necessarily want to hear from Palestinians, despite the fact that we have an array of exceptionally talented bright people who have a great contribution to make. Um, so it's a slow process. This is a very difficult time politically where there is a very toxic environment where Palestinians are being silenced in every sphere. Um, and so it's all the more essential that we come together as a group and that we make ourselves heard. Um, we're not willing to be silenced. Ben, I mean, if I could, if I could turn to you, I mean, um... You know, look at looking at uh, sort of the, the, the I, I suppose the mainstream media um, language has been uh, kind of affected by the campaigning around the Palestinian issue in recent months. I mean, there's, the, the, it does appear in so many ways that um, despite all of the difficulties and setbacks and what have you, the arguments are really cutting through. Um, and you, you 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 can argue about the use of of language and what have you, but you know clearly. Um, apartheid is a, is much more widely accepted as a, a situation pertaining in Israel Palestine. A settler colonialism is another. Um, you could say that despite these horrendous things that Amy's just been talking about that are happening all the time um, to Palestinians, there is a much greater degree of awareness. Partly also, I suppose, because of the extreme nature of this particular Israeli government. So, with all of that. Um, and with the fact that you've got, you know, the, you know, the British Palestine Committee coming together, we've got the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. There's a real, there's a real sort of global reach, um, and 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 a greater sort of understanding of the issue. The UK government thinks that this is the right kind of time to bring in this bill, um, and I just wonder if you could give us some idea, really, about what this bill is all about and why the government thinks it can introduce it now. Oh, I think we've lost your sound, Ben. Can you hear me? Yes, we've got you, we've got uh, you. Okay, all right. Um, thank you, Mark. And um, I agree with what you've said and concur with the remarks that Amy's just been making um but agreeing what you're saying and how you've framed uh, that question and what has shifted uh in terms of i think public understanding but certainly in terms of understanding across civil society of of exactly what is happening uh, and the type of language we should use to address it um and Yes, it is in this moment that the government has decided to introduce this bill. I mean, it's worth saying we have been anticipating this bill for some time. The government promised to do this in its manifesto in 2019. There was a very narrow reason, first of all, why they were doing that, which was um, your viewers will recall they made a previous attempt to do this uh, in 2016 17 by introducing regulations attached to pension law that would have stopped local government pension schemes from divesting from companies that were complicit in violation of international law all designed to shield israel from accountability and your viewers will recall sc took them to court and after a long battle we we won in the supreme court and those regulations were overturned. The reason we won, the grounds on which we won, was that we did not have the power to do what it was trying to do. So, in a sense, this is its answer to that. It is giving itself the power by introducing priority legislation. But in terms of the deeper reason, why is it doing it? Uh, and why does it think um, this is worthwhile? There are a number of reasons. One, we're understanding this in the context of a government that's bringing a whole range of repression measures designed to suppress broadly, not just in relation to Palestine, but the right to protest the policing bill, the right to strike bill, uh, many others. Uh, but there's a broader global context. It is impossible not to see this in the wider context of the effort by Israel and its allies 
to silence Palestinian voices, but in particular to suppress growing support for the campaign launched by Palestinians in 2005 for boycott, divestment and sanctions. And part of that is through what's termed lawfare, which is trying to persuade willing allies uh, to introduce laws that in uh, various, uh, through various methods, try to prescribe uh, the support for BDS. And we've seen that happening in various European countries, in more than 35 uh, states in the US. So it comes in that context. There's also a narrow political agenda going on as well for this government is they see this, I think, as something that can embarrass the Labour Party by uh, returning to a conversation that conflates support for Palestinian rights with anti-Semitism mm. uh, and therefore putting the Labour Party in a position where if it seeks to oppose this bill, then it can make the argument, well, you are a weak in tackling anti-Semitism. So all of those motivations are entirely nefarious, but you're right to ask the question at a, you know, at, at any time in the previous decades to be doing this would be wrong, but to choose to introduce this bill at a time where Israel is ramping up its violent imposition of apartheid. We've seen over 170 Palestinians killed this year, rate of more than one a day, just in the West Bank uh, alone. Those actions carried out by a government that is without doubt the most extreme in Israel's history, the most racist ultra-nationalist with members who are self-declared proud racists and proud fascists. Uh, it's an interesting moment to decide this is the moment to bring in a bill uh, who is, which the sole motivation really is to attempt to shield Israel from accountability. Well, yes, because Ben, I was, I was quite struck that the, the, the language used uh, by the government in the bill. I mean, there was just to take this 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 one um, uh, piece of phraseology I picked mm. out. Um, today's bill, this is the essentially the ministry, the, the government um, explaining uh, why is putting the bill through at this time. Today's bill will stop businesses and organizations, including those affiliated with Israel, being targeted through ongoing boycotts by public bodies, leading to community tensions, and in the case of Israel, a rise in anti-Semitism. So two things leapt out of me there. One, one is that this is supposed to be a catch-all for boycotts against um, uh, uh, injustice, apartheid, uh, racism, wherever it may be taking place in the world. But then it becomes really quite specific. And it refers to one country, it refers just to Israel. Israel, And it makes this claim that um, campaigning for sanctions actually encourages anti-Semitism, which is a bizarre argument, it seems to me. I mean, imagine that argument being used against the anti-apartheid protesters against South Africa. Why, 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 how, how, what evidence can the government offer for this? Well, well, there isn't, um, and you're right, and this is the standard narrative when I've talked about this sort of broader um, campaign um, to suppress Palestinian voices, to suppress advocacy for Palestine on a global basis and the use of uh, laws prescribing um, support for BDS as a key component. The, the standard narrative used, the underpinning rationale in all of those cases is is this narrative of anti-Semitism, which has two sort of variations. That is most extreme is the argument that it is inherently anti-Semitic uh, to advocate for BDS uh, when your target uh, is Israel's violation of the rights of the Palestinian people, or a second version, will it ferment anti-Semitism? You're right, first of all, it's a ludicrous argument on various levels. It first of all obviously conflates uh, Jewish people with the actions of uh, the state of Israel. But right, if you try to draw an equivalent, um, um, because obviously the BDS campaign is a Palestinian-led campaign, um, and to suggest that Palestinians in calling for mm. action uh, to divest from companies that are complicit in their oppression is motivated by racist intentions. As you say, imagine that argument being used to say, well, black South Africans, when they were calling for boycott in relation to apartheid, were motivated by an innate hatred uh, of white people or white South Africans. Imagine anybody trying to make the argument now uh, that when Ukrainians call for action in relation to Russia's illegal invasion and occupation of their land, they must be motivated by Rus Russophobia, an, an inherent hatred of the Russian people. And ask your question, what's the evidence? 
There's none. The government impact assessment, um, which which it has to do to justify what's the cost of this bill, what's the rationale for it, what are the consequences of not taking action. And in that, they again raise this argument about an increase uh, in community tensions, etc. The argument is incredibly thin, and one of the views, for example, involves in a complete mischaracterization can talk about of how the tactics of boycott work. They work is to go to a public body, for example, when you're calling for divestment, say, look, we don't think you should be investing in any company complicit in violations of international law and human rights. And here's some evidence we're going to give you about where you are investing. Here's the evidence how these companies are complicit in these violations. We're asking you to take action. What the government's used in its impact assessment is an example of something that may or may not have happened. It was given some press attention at the time, but a um, worker in Sainsbury's took action to remove kosher goods uh, that were not from Israel from uh, a shelf in Sainsbury's. The rationale being, I feared that this might be targeted um, by the shop would be targeted otherwise by BDS campaigners. There is no legitimate BDS campaign that has ever said you must remove kosher goods from shops. If that ever happened it involved it, it was the product of a complete mischaracterization of how boycott works so there's no credible evidence um this side the nonsense of the argument about it being inherently anti-semitic to say that boycott campaigns will drive people to have anti-semitic views drive them to have an innate hatred of the jewish people mm. Well, thank you very much, Ben. And we are getting, I'll come to some of you who are sending your questions in, but I just want to quickly come back to Amy because, I mean, and of course, many of you watching will be probably involved in the BDS campaign, but there will be others who will say, well, yes, we, this all makes kind of sense, but Pat, we're not, we're a little bit unclear about what the campaign is really about and on what basis does it operate. I mean, just to be so, so it's clear for the for any government minister who happens to amble past Palestine deep dive or gets sent this link, could you just explain, Amy, what the Boycott Divestment Sanctions campaign seeks to do? Um, certainly. Um, I mean, as, as Ben said, it was a call um, from Palestinian uh, civil society organisations, and that included unions, women's organisations, refugee networks, and Palestinian citizens of Israel. And it was really seen as a, a, a very clear way inspired by South, the case of South Africa and the boycott there in terms of a way to pressure Israel to stop its oppression of Palestinians and essentially disregard for international law. So its calls are very, very simple. It calls for the ending of Israel's occupation and colonization of Palestinian lands and the dismantling of the wall the recognizing of fundamental rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality, and also respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. So these are three very clear calls or, or explanations of what the boycott what lies behind the boycott there's nothing there's nothing um uh dangerous about it it's about upholding the laws that britain supposedly supports mm -hmm. um so that, you know i think it's a very simple simple um tool in order to to bring about freedom justice and equality but essentially there's a lot of um, misrepresentation and a lot of obfuscation around it that tries to make it sound as if it is some kind of nefarious movement when actually all it's doing is calling for the rights of Palestinians to self-determination and the right of return to be upheld. Yes, it does seem, I mean, it does seem um, as though it's been thrown together in some haste and could be picked apart quite easily by, well, as you're both doing, um, what a shame you're both not in Parliament. But what do you think the prospects are of it getting through the Commons and then getting through the Lords? It could be, it could be, it could be um, in trouble in the Lords, could it not? Possibly. What do you think, Amy? 
Um, well, I think we can never assume that to be the case. I think mm. it's very important that people of conscience do actively put as much pressure as they possibly can and make their voices heard to their members of parliament um, and to make sure that um, that there is as much action on this as possible. We shouldn't either feel complacent that it will get tranced in the Lords or that there's no point in doing anything because it's going to get through. There are kind of two different <laughs> approaches about mm. it, both of which could be very dangerous. And I think the, the, the key thing is that people need to mobilise around this issue now. Yes. It's a very dangerous moment, and not just for Palestinians, but in, in for any kind of social justice or climate justice movement. This is essential that this law doesn't get through. Um, well, and we all have to work Amy, together on that. Yeah, no, sorry. I was just, I mean, Ben, I mean, as Amy's saying, this is not just, doesn't just affect the BDS uh, campaign. It can affect any organisation calling for similar sanctions on similar grounds. Yeah. So, well, you're getting some, you, are you getting some indication that local authorities are pushing back hard? Uh, that you, you're being supported by lots of other organisations as well to try and stop this? Yeah, and look, we've been, it's worth just saying something about very quickly on how this how this bill is framed. So what it says is a public body cannot make a decision uh, not to invest in or not to procure from a company based on disapproval of the actions of a foreign state. So that's the way it's framed. And you're right. Well, what does that mean? Obviously, we know that the major target of this is is to target um, campaigns advocating for the rights of Palestinian people. Uh, but it affects a whole range of campaigns. And we have been working at the Palestine Solidarity Campaign very hard and very successfully over the past couple of years in building a very, very broad coalition of opposition. We've got nearly 70 organizations that have come together. Wow. Um, climate justice groups, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, um, trade unions, more than a dozen trade unions, faith groups, the Quakers, the Methodist Church, the United Reformed Church, the Muslim Association of Britain, the Jewish Diaspora uh, Alliance, um, a whole range of organizations, Liberty, who are coming together because they see this as a bill that targets a whole range of campaigns for justice, that is a threat to freedom of expression and is a threat to local democracy. And on the latter, uh, there is also opposition from local authorities uh, that comes from uh, a number of angles. One is that there is absolutely no need for this. Secondly, that it is their responsibility to make decisions about how they invest and putting in this requirement that they have to wait for the government to decide uh, does is your decision based on the disapproval of a foreign state is going to make that task incredibly complicated for them. So the, let's say they want to withdraw because of straightforward violations of international law and human rights. Well, will that be interpreted as they're disapproving of a particular state? Because obviously um, violations of international law and human rights happen in specific places. So you have to demonstrate here is where it's happening. And this is why we're going to divest from this company uh, that's supporting that. The other thing that's very important in terms of local opposition to this and speaks a bit to the opposition of trade unions in relation in particular to one aspect of who's who's going to be affected. So public bodies means universities. It means local councils. It means local government pension schemes. Now, in relation to local government pension schemes, the, the government's trying to make the argument this is public money that you should not be spending. The answer to that is it's not public money. It's the deferred wages mm. of local council workers who are represented by their trade unions. And they should have a right, and they are making this case incredibly strongly, and they sit on the relevant pension boards to say, this is our money, it's our deferred wages, it's up to us, not up to you, the government, to decide do we want this invested in support of war crimes in support of violations of human rights in support of violations of international law. And they'll be very clear, no, they do not. And it's their right to make that decision. Uh, it's not um, a matter that should be decided by the UK government. So are we looking at a potential, if, if this bill were to go through, of some kind of government committee that has to examine every uh, proposed boycott that, that some authority or organ public organisation wishes to take? And as an adjunct to that, is some... Um, is this really just Michael Gove 
is it this is this is very much his 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 baby isn't it is it just essentially him pushing this i know that i think there was a government there was some kind of commitment from the government but he seems to be the one really behind it um i mean the answer i'll give to the latter on that is is michael gove is one of those who has i would say an ideological commitment to this piece of legislation uh, he has someone he has been somebody who for many years has been pushing this nefarious narrative as part of a desire to shield Israel from accountability um, of anti-Semitic motivations by those seeking to advocate for Palestinian rights and to hold Israel to account. But it's not a simple matter of this is happening because Michael Gove supports it. So there are those, as I say, those range of other uh, factors. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it so happens it's landed at a point where Michael Gove is in the relevant government department uh, that is handling this bill. Um, the other thing I was going to say in relation to the question you put earlier, um, because there is this wide body of opposition, um, we cannot, the numbers in the Commons make this extremely difficult to defeat because mm -hmm. it would require 40 Conservative MPs rebelling against it. Uh, but you asked the question about can this be defeated in the Lords? And there is potential there. There's, a, as I said, the groups who are involved in this are pushing hard. Their arguments are being listened to. In that regard, the position of the Labour Party is extremely important. Uh, we need the Labour Party to oppose this because that matters in the House of Lords, uh, that it makes it possible that um, there can be significant opposition in the Lords um, if Labour Lords um, are all going to be voting on block to oppose this. So there is potential, but obviously we have to fight this through a number of mechanisms. If we do not succeed in getting this stopped, then there will be other ways in which we look, including the potential for legal action uh, to stop this bill um, actually having impact and having effect. Yeah, right. Well, look, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, look, do send in your questions. We have a few. We're getting a lot of people commenting, but it would be good to have some actual, uh, some more questions. I've got one here. This is from Maria in Doncaster. Now, I wonder if I could put Maria's question uh, to you, Amy. Um, so she says, following Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the UK government adopted a clear stance of opposing annexation of territory by force and employed economic sanctions. Uh, rather more than that, in fact, as we know, which came into effect immediately in order to compel Russia to end its actions and respect international law. Yet in the case of Palestine, the UK government is trying to ban public bodies from doing just that. How can we make sense of this clear double standard today on Ukraine and on Palestine? That's for you, Amy. Um, yes, I mean, essentially, this bill is doubling down on that double standard. I mean, that's that's exactly what it's about. And again, I think it is to do with changing the very way of thinking about Palestine, because it is rooted in framing the, the situation away from the root causes, away from the ongoing drivers of the problem, um, and that allows for the kind of thinking that brings about that kind of double standard. So essentially, we have to go beyond this sort of illusion of peace building and managing conflict and have a real shift in the paradigm when we're talking about the situation that is rooted in historical fact and also in the current reality. Um, so that means avoiding talking about clashes on both sides mm. or a cycle of violence, which really obscures the power dynamics so that people don't see that what is happening is one very powerful state, that it has a military occupation, and a series of apartheid policies and practices that essentially are part of its expansionist settler colonial regime. And unless we look at it in that light, those sorts of double standards are going to continue because people will say Ukraine is a very different situation. It's not about military might when we're looking at Israel. It's not about settler colonialism. It's not about annexation um, because there's this huge obfuscation 
to what the actual issue is. And the second thing is around accountability, because this kind of way of looking at, at the situation means that cherry picking around international law about when you act and when you don't becomes very easy if those are the kinds of ways that you're looking um, at the, the, the whole situation. So essentially, we have to make sure as part and parcel of our approach to this and this legislation is right at the heart of it, is ensuring that British policy upholds its own obligations, the UK's obligations under international law um, and its own supposed commitment to human rights. Um, so, and that's why it's so essential that this bill doesn't go through because we will really have a huge upset in, or, or rather we'll have a huge entrenchment of the way in which Palestine has been treat, treated for the last 75 years when actually this needs to be overturned because it cannot continue the way that it is. And that means also making sure that we're able to oppose repressive legislation and mm. actions which are very clearly designed to limit accountability like this anti-boycott bill and other kinds of actions as well in terms of really making sure that the that Britain defends human rights defenders and around the world for Palestinians, but also beyond that, and protects and supports organizations that are being targeted by Israel rather than actually doing the same thing to them. And, and that's basically trying to criminalize those human rights defenders and organizations that are trying to uphold international law. Yes, and I, and I, so as you're saying that, I'm just thinking that, you know, in advance of the sanctions against um, the Putin uh, and Russia, um, had this legislation been in place, it would have been quite possible for a council that had decided to boycott Russian companies that had links with Ukraine. Um, that 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 could that could be that could fall foul of this law. This is the kind of the 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 the, 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 uh, the, the it sort of demonstrates how it hasn't really been thought through but also brings actually actually you could because it's in line with british government policy so essentially it's about the uk government being in control of yeah. which sanctions are in place and that's that nobody good, right, else yes, can decide that a lack of consistency I, and i want to i think. just wanted to add something because marie's absolutely right in the question about the double standard but there's something in the in this bill itself, which reinforces that, um, but also undermines a core part of the government's argument, which is campaigns, um, BDS campaigns, which target Israel are treating Israel to a different standard. Um, and the, the, the bills, as, as I said, says you cannot divest, a public body cannot make a decision not to invest or not to procure on the basis of disapproval of a foreign state's um, conduct. But then it has a clause that says, but a government minister can identify exceptions to that. So a government minister, by making a statement in the House, can say this does not apply to this particular state. And the government has already said, so emphasise the Maurice point, we are going to say as soon as this bill passes, it does not apply to Russia and Belarus. So if you want to divest because you are appalled by what um, a company is doing to support Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, then you're allowed to do that. However, there's another clause which is very, very specific and says, however, a government minister can never use that power to make an exception in relation to Israel or companies complicit in relation to the occupied Palestinian territory. And it includes also the Golan Heights. So in other words, the one thing no government, future government minister can ever do is go up in the House of Commons and say, actually, we're going to allow this in relation to Israel. So what the government is doing, instead of this argument that those of us advocating for Palestinian rights are somehow singling out Israel, treating it unfairly, treating it by a different standard, it's actually the government that of all the states in the world, there's only one that it has identified to give a special protection from accountability to through this bill, and that is Israel. So it's the government that's saying Israel should be treated differently and whilst we might want to hold every other state to account for violations of international law and human rights, we will never, through this legislation, ever do that in relation to Israel. And, and to what extent is is this um, policy being pursued elsewhere in the world? Is, is this unique to Britain or is it happening elsewhere? 
is happening in in many countries most notably over 35 um, us states have passed their own versions of this law they they're, they're, they're operating slightly differently in the states so what they're doing there uh, the main version of uh, similar anti-boycott laws are saying uh, you can't have a contract with a state as a company or even as an individual unless you sign a statement saying you do not support uh, and will never be engaged in a BDS in relation to Israel. Um, two things there. Those, are, those um, laws are being challenged through the courts with some success. But the other thing that's happened, which, which we are utilizing as part of the argument of the broader impact of such laws in the us those laws have then been used as a framework to introduce similar laws that say you can't have a contract with the state if for example you oppose um uh, if you are advocating for gun laws you cannot have a contract with the state if you are advocating for abortion rights so we've seen and, and you cannot have a contract with the states in some states they pass versions that say you cannot have a contract if you are calling for fossil fuel divestment so that's illustrating the point once you've established the principle that a government can say we can determine what type of ethical investment is allowed and what type isn't then you establish a precedent for that to be used for whatever types of policies the government of the day might happen to disapprove of. And that's interesting. So, Amy, if I can come to you on this briefly. So, I mean, if, if we look at a brave new world where governments are in, essentially in charge of uh, ethics and uh, morality, uh, where, where does that leave other groups? Where does that leave, let's say, for the example, the Church of England? What would happen if the Church of England started saying, this is unacceptable, we need to, we need to take action, we need to be supporting boycotts? Are they going to arrest bishops? I mean, well, as as um, Ben said, plenty of faith groups ha have been part of the coalition that is very troubled by this uh, this bill and will act against it. I mean, you, you know, discussions around the church and the state have ever been have ever been, <laughs> been vibrant. However, I think um, this is sort of, it's not just, I mean, this isn't uh, uh, about religion. It's, it's about democratic rights. Mm -hmm. It's about progressive social justice movements and the right to protest. And it's about having an ability as citizens to actually call our governments to account which is necessary, clearly, always in in uh, around the globe. Um, but I think that this is a move that is coming with a, a shift that has been happening actually a lot and slowly over the last few years. It's been increasing immensely in terms of the kinds of pressure that is coming out, and it's part and parcel of a much bigger push on any kind of mobilization for a just world, one that isn't necessarily driven by the kinds of drivers that we're seeing, a very right-wing approach across Europe and, and in the States and, and in other places taking place. And it's part and parcel of something that we can't just watch and let go by as we sort of slip into um, a kind of authoritarian state without taking mm -hmm. action. And it, we can sleepwalk very easily into, into something like this. There's a, there's a question here. This is from Jamal in Leicester. Um, what do the panellists think of the new conservative group claiming solidarity with Palestine? I think this is Baroness Vossi has, has put this together. I think she's claiming 30-odd um members um and uh, it's uh, it, why should we trust politicians in a party who show no regard for the vulnerable in their own country the uk uh why why, why should we trust them to show genuine concern for millions of palestinians enduring apartheid um ben what, what do you what do you make of jamal's question um well so answering the bit which is about uh, so he's talking about the formation of a new group called Conservative Friends 
of Palestine. Um, the Baroness Varsi is setting up. Look, I, I would say this. Look, on, on one, one level, um, the establishments, and, and, and Amy and I were both at a meeting in Parliament where it was announced that this group was, uh, was being set up. Um, I think we both commented in the meeting in terms of our response. So I'll say something similar here, which is, look, on one level, it is always welcome where there is a counter pressure to what is particularly within the Conservative Party, a very strong influence of pro-Israel voices. But the challenge for any group that wants to be genuinely advocating for Palestinian rights is that it listens to what the Palestinian people are saying, going back to what Amy said at the beginning, um, and adopts the right framings. What has protected Israel from accountability? Um, what has made our government, our public bodies, uh, our companies and corporations complicit is a narrative that has framed this situation as, as a territorial conflict, as a um, competitive um, conflict between uh, different nationalistic agendas that requires compromise, requires an end to violence by bringing communities together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And within all of that, that frames Israel as a participant in that conflict, as a liberal democracy that at worst is over overseeing a military occupation, which is problematic, which but which it would like to bring to an end. And any group who were starting from that sort of perspective is not going to do much good. So it needs to be prepared to address the realities that um, Amy was articulating earlier, that Palestinian civil society has been articulating for many, many years. And as you said, Mark, is now becoming a consensus across the international civil society and international human rights uh, community, which is what we're dealing with here, um, is a situation in which in all the land between the river and the sea, um, policy is enacted on the principle that one people, the Jewish people, have rights, and the second, the Palestinians, do not have rights. Uh, and that has led to the imposition of a system of injustice that, as many groups have articulated, uh, meets the legal definition of apartheid. And that's the reality you need to embrace and look at what are the consequences of that. And going back again to what Amy said earlier, what is it that the British government needs to be doing in terms of upholding its responsibilities, including under international, to address that. Any group that's starting from that perspective can do a lot of good work. Uh, but that's the perspective on which it needs to be starting from if it is going to do good work in the parliamentary space. Thank you, Ben. Uh, this is a question. Uh, this is for Amy. This is from Miriam. Uh, she's from London. Please, may Amy, highlight some of the key policies Palestinians are calling for in the British Palestinian Committee, what does she think of the overwhelming focus on the issue of recognition uh, by the left in politics? Is this not setting the bar very low? Shouldn't we be advocating for sanctions and pushing the apartheid discourse and criminalizing those going from the UK to serve in Israel's occupation forces? That's, a, that's more than one question. That's about three or four. <laughs> Maria. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of recognition, I think that um, the question one has to ask about recognition is what is it actually going to deliver for the Palestinian people? What is it going to change on the ground? And um, I think these are these are the things that it's actually very easy for a symbolic gesture around recognizing Palestine and then nothing that actually follows up from that. So that's why we came back with this very simple starter of three steps around framing the issue, around accountability, which really does mean more practical, active states when we're talking steps when we're talking about accountability. We're talking about supporting the International Criminal Court rather than trying to block access for Palestinians to it. We're talking about supporting the UN Independent Commission of Inquiry. We're talking about reconstituting the UN Special Committee against Apartheid and, and, um, and also the UN Centre of Apartheid because these are the things that we need to really be uh, focusing on in order to have an impact for people's lives, whether that be Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, Palestinian citizens of Israel or refugees um, around the world. These are the things that we need to do 
using, as I said before, repressive legislation um, that's designed to clamp down on those kinds of actions. Um, and also other laws for, for British Palestinians, for example, British nationals, including British Palestinians who can't access Palestine because of the new COGAT laws um, and making sure that Britain is taking active steps around ensuring that those discriminatory procedures aren't being carried out against British citizens so that they're not denied entry when they're trying to travel to Palestine and that they're split from their families and their friends and that they don't have access to their ancestral homeland. These are very key basic things that the government could be doing um, and essentially really making sure that we're supporting um, organisations that are being targeted by Israel. Mm and making sure that Palestinians are part and parcel of the policy making. It's quite extraordinary that you can have so many decisions being made about Palestinians, about their fate, without them having any involvement in it. So civil society, is civil society calling for recognition to the Palestinian or what is civil Palestinian civil society calling for? Actually, Palestinian civil society has been calling for boycott, divestment and sanctions since 2005. And we should be acting on that because there's a real belief that that can have a definite impact for Palestinians everywhere. Um, so I think it's very much about listening to the people who are most impacted by the kinds of policy making decisions um, that are happening and protecting space for both Palestinians and advocates to defend and claim their rights. Um, whilst also improving mechanisms for any marginalised communities in the UK to have their voices heard. Um, so I think there are many things that could be done um, and that focusing on one specific issue like recognition is simply not enough. Well, look, Amy, Ben, we are kind of uh, sadly approaching the um, the end of our show, but I mean, we, we are, this is, we're shortly going to have a general election in this country. Um, this, this legislation is being challenged heavily, uh, but there's no doubt that Palestine in, as an issue in an election is an important one. Um, certainly it is for the Labour Party and at least 30 or 40 constituencies up and down the, up and down the land. So, I mean, the question really for you both, um, in the run-up to that election, what can people be doing? What are, what are the real pressure points? And one, just one, just to throw this in, going back to the anti-apartheid um, boycott campaigns uh, with South Africa, there was a very clearly identified targets that everybody understood. It was one, Barclays Bank was singled out. Does there not need to be something similar to kind of bring people together, to focus, to bring this focus? Um, Amy, can I, can I, I'll have to go to you because I think Ben, to you first, uh, because we've just lost Ben, hopefully he'll, he'll come back. But, you know, with election, with a general election approaching, where should people's energies be be um, be put? Um, well, I think um, I'll, I'll I'll let Ben talk a, a little bit more about this too. But essentially, I think that um, making sure that their MPs are listening to their concerns uh, around Palestine that this is an important issue for them. Um, is is absolutely essential because I think um, one of the things that parliamentarians have always said is that they do respond, they do take note of letters when they're written to them. Um, they do actually take note as to what their constituents think about certain foreign policy um, and domestic issues. And this is is something that's playing out as part of domestic policy and also as part of foreign policy as well. So I think this is something that people need to show in the run-up to the election that they are very engaged on. Um, and again, taking the three steps that we've talked about in terms of how to frame, frame talking about Palestine, how to press on accountability and how to ensure that Palestinian voices are being heard. These are very th three very simple things. What we've got is a very complicated system of injustice and regime of oppression we've got sorry uh, and a very simple situation of injustice rather so it's a regime that's very complicated that makes it difficult for people to think that it's far too complex to know how to engage on this issue but actually it can be treated very simply it's not difficult to understand 
what key things need changing so that we can start to actually have a proper discussion about what would bring that about change on the ground. So, Ben, coming to you and the upcoming British election, should the yeah. emphasis be on uh, making sure that the P British political parties all support uh, uh, the recognition of the state of Palestine? Should it be uh, a promise to reverse this BDS legislation if it goes through? What, what, where do you think people's energy should be devoted to? And how, how powerful, I mean, how important do you think Palestine can be in a British general election? Um, I'll come, and apologies, I hope you can hear me okay. I, I disappeared briefly. I'm getting signs saying I'm unstable, which I'm sure is a uh, reference to look very stable my to internet us. and not my you're psychological world. But, okay. <laughs> I mean, look, um, uh, let me, I think, let me answer it first of all in terms of the immediate, because obviously we're talking about this bill. It is important that this bill is defeated. Um, so there are a number of things that people can do in relation to that. There's a, an e-action that PSC has put out, which enables you to write to your MP, tell them to oppose the bill. Um, it also drives them into a briefing that we, alongside groups like Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, um, and others are holding for MPs next week. So please respond to those. They're all on the PSC website. Uh, there's a petition we've set up in opposition to the bill. We need as many people as possible. We've already got, I think, about 12,000 signatures. We need a lot more uh, to that. Uh, we're going to be holding a protest because this bill is not going to finish its journey through the Commons until the autumn. So sometime around September, October, we will be organising a big demonstration in London. But that's all about, if you like, what I call protecting the space. How do we f fight these efforts um, to silence voices and to close down activism. That's important. But one of the things I always say is we protect the space, we also act to enlarge it. And in that terrain, we need to remember that this bill, as pernicious as it is, affects public bodies. It doesn't affect the rights of private citizens to take their own decisions, to join collective campaigns for boycott that target specific complicit companies. We've got two that we're running at the moment, one targeting Barclays Bank, one targeting Puma. People can find details on our website. And it's really important that we ramp up all of those efforts. In relation to them, what's the message that we take into the election campaign? It is always a challenge to make an issue like Palestine a fundamental um, voting issue for people. We know that. But what we have to do, and we will be working hard when it comes to the election, to put it on the agenda. We know it matters when people tell the MP we care about this. Um, the bottom line of what we're asking for uh, from um, different political parties, and if we end up, as seems likely, with a Labour Party, what we want from them has always been established in policy that um, effectively is Labour Party policy, although we're not naive enough to think it's going to determine their manifesto. It was passed at the Labour Party conference a couple of years ago with unanimous support across the trade union movement, across members, and it calls for Labour to take meaningful action to end all trade with settlements. So we should certainly be abandoning this free trade deal that the government wants to set up. It calls for action to end the arms trade. And what it does effectively is not asking for special treatment in relation to Israel. It's saying hold Israel to account as any rights violating state should be held to account, act ethically. As Palestinians, I often sit on panels with Omar Barghouti, the co-founder of the BDS movement. He's always asked the question, what do you want from us? And he always gives the same answer. Do us no harm. How do you do that? End your complicity. Take action to end the complicity of your government, end the complicity of your public bodies, end the complicity of your companies and corporations, because without their support, without that complicity, uh, Israel could not sustain its regime of oppression and and that's what we have to consistently and we don't just work in lobbying parliaments that's an a parliamentarians that's an important space we take action across civil society we join boycott campaigns and we raise awareness across the communities that we live in um, to make sure this becomes a central issue of justice uh, everywhere uh, where political decision making takes place thank you very much ben thank you amy just uh just before we go, um, yeah, so 
to, to, to read more about British Palestine Committee's policy briefing, we've got the links there. Please uh, click on them if you haven't. Um, don't forget to give us uh, Palestine Deep Dive a thumbs up. And thank you for uh, Vicky Nicolaidis, who's done that. Um, Kurt Godel has done that. Thank you very much. Learn more about the British Palestinian Committee. There's the web link. Um, Tommy Apple says, I'm a Zionist. I really enjoy the broadcast. I understand your frustration. Kudos to you for continuing despite all the setbacks. Shalom from Israel. So there we have it. We are here at Palestine Deep Dive. We've been very, very lucky to have with us today, Ben and Amy. Um, and uh, please catch up with us. Um, please spread the word. Please spread this video because there'll be lots of people wanting to know a whole lot more about the legislation that is currently going through Parliament that would outlaw the boycott uh, and divestment and sanctions uh, movement and its many of its activities. So please support uh, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign and all the work that Amy's is doing as well. And we shall see you all, I hope, uh, soon here again. So thank you very much, Amy. Thank you, Ben. And um, good luck. We'll, we'll march forward. Take care. <laughs>